understand. So uh, we'll be starting even if people are still uh, joining us. Uh, so this talk is part of the Social Justice Fellows Lunchtime Seminars and the uh, from the Social Justice Center. The center is co-directed with uh, by Bengi Akulut, who is also professor at the Department of Geography, Planning and the Environment. The Social Justice Center mandate is to encourage social justice research. Hi, Kobe. Hi. You can sit here okay. if you want. <laughs> can I sit here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so every Friday, our graduate fellow, fellows present their work in progress to get feedback from one another and the broader community. And today we will hear Nicolas Gobertan on invisible carers, making the case for racialized young carers. So Nicolas is an interdisciplinary PhD student and a graduate fellow at the Social Justice Center. Uh, and uh, Nicolas' talk will be followed by a commentary by Arceli Dokumaki. Dokumaki? Dokumaki. Dokumaki. Wow, okay, sorry. <laughs> Who is this assistant professor in communication studies and Canada's research chair in critical disability studies and media technologies, and also director of the Access in the Making Lab. But before we start, I would like to uh, remind ourselves that. Um, as researchers in social justice, our mandate is to encourage and support social justice research. So we are committed to encouraging people to learn about indigenous issues, to support indigenous struggles for self-determination and the protection of nature, and to active, actively resist colonialism and neo-colonialism. Neo so thank you for being here and thank you for uh, people who are online uh, joining us. And it's your turn, Nicola. Okay, amazing. Thank you for that. I'm very impressed. <laughs> thank you, thank you, everyone. I'm very impressed, Christian, that you pronounced an Indian last name with a French accent. I thought that was amazing. So, yeah, first of all, I just want to say hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Can we get a thumbs up in the Zoom if you're doing well? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, I just want to give a few thank yous before I begin. First of all, thank you so much, Christy Ann and Bengi, who will probably walk in here any second now. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Really, it came at a point in my life where the flame was dimming a little bit. Oh, no. And to get um, the support from the Social Justice Center really ignited that and helped me. So it came at a perfect time. So thank you so, so, so much for this. As well, I'd like to give absolute gratitude and thanks to Arceli Dokumachi. Mm -hmm. Um, Arceli is here commenting and being present, but most of all, Arceli, thank you for being you. As we'll see as I go throughout this presentation that you were very instrumental in making a lot of my ideas come true. And I did not start doing work on young carers. So the fact that this all came together perfectly, I thank you so much for your help. And on that note as well, um, I wanna make note of that the AIM Lab here at Concordia, the Access in the Making Lab, it's directed by Arceli, and it's a collective of just absolutely brilliant scholars, PhD and master students, amongst others. And I know I've seen some of you when I was scrolling through the name earlier. So thank you so much for showing your support. And I just appreciate all of you. And I wanted to give, um, give a quick note about the AIM Lab, Access to the Making Lab. And the final thank you here is for Oliver Fitz Fitzpatrick, who I seen your name there. Thank you so much for showing up, Oliver. Um, what's really interesting about about Oliver is he come, um, they come from um, Ami Quebec. And this is super, super important because the young carers as an identity is really, really small in Canada. And Oliver has this position of the young carers project coordinator and is doing absolutely incredible work. And I thank you so much, Oliver, for sharing my work. It meant a lot. And I look forward to building a relationship and really go growing the young carer conversation. So thank you. So there I gave out my roses to everyone. Thank you so much for showing up. Um, I have two quick housekeeping rules that I would like to mention before I begin. First is a land acknowledgement. I know we sort of did one, but I want to mention that as part of my own decolonial practice that um, I want to do a short one here for myself. And I'm from Toronto, otherwise known as Toronto, and in particular, Scarborough. This area of Southern Ontario is known as the dish with one spoon territory. 
and I found this beautiful entry from X University, formerly known as um, previously known as Ryerson, and I thought it really captured um, what the dish with one spoon territory means, and also some of the ideas that I'm pulling out in this conversation. So, and I quote here. The dish, or sometimes it is called the bowl, represents what is now Southern Ontario. We all eat out of the dish. All of us share this territory with only one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. And importantly, there are no knives at this table. And I love that so much representing that we must keep the peace. And in the conversation of young carers, I think it's so important to speak about that interdependence, that care, that love all together. And these ideas will kind of permeate and circle around as we go throughout the conversation. And the second housekeeping rule is doing visual descriptions. So as my commitment to disability justice, I think the Social Justice Center is the perfect place for this. And what I'll be doing is doing visual descriptions of myself, but also as the paintings while I flip through them. And the main reason for this is for individuals who have visual impairments. But even if we think about it, if you were to call into the Zoom conversation, you would not be able to see the presentation. So at least by giving a visual description, I'm able to paint the picture and create a parallel experience. So everyone has this holistic um, description of the imagery that's here. So it's normally a practice, especially during Zoom meetings, to describe yourself. And I'll do so here that, hello everyone, my name is Nicholas Goberdan. I'm a brown skinned individual. I have long, very long <laughs> curly hair, um, big black aviator glasses. I have two nose rings on each nostril and I'm wearing a black jacket with a black shirt underneath. And I encourage and I encourage everyone to think about visual description as you do your work and efforts to make everything more inclusive. So here is my presentation. As you can see <laughs> on the screen, we have invisible carers making the case for racialized young carers. The simple definition is that young carers are individuals under the age of 25 that care for a family member that, ex that is experiencing disability illness and aging amongst others. This definition is often contested and it's usually on two points, one of which is the age. Some say 25, some say 18, some say 30. But in Canada, there's a kind of accepted definition of 25 and just for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna go with that as well. As well as the point of labor. So here's the thing, this is also very contested as well. How do you quantify labor in order to become a young carer? Is it you have to work 13 hours to 17 hours? Or is it 30 hours? Like, how do you measure that? And I think there's so much um, labor, but I think more powerfully care work that happens when sitting and eating ice cream beside a disabled person. That is the care work. That's the beautiful part about it. Singing a lullaby to a disabled person while they, for them to go to sleep. That is the care work. And how do you quantify that into hours? So for that, Reason we're just going to say people who take care of a disabled um, person or someone experiencing illness, aging, and amongst others. So I want to explain what I'm going to go through in this presentation, and that is that I try to do things a little bit different. As you can see, there's a painting. I have five slides only, and they're all painted. <laughs> yes, they're not filled with text, so I'm going to try to make it more creative into a story. But the first point of this is that. I'm speaking from my PhD proposal and it's in its first draft and it's still incomplete. So for that reason, I end up having more questions <laughs> than answers. But I actually think that's not a bad thing. I think that's actually really great at this point. Um, I'm always in the belief that if you have all the answers now, what's the point of doing the research, right? So I think a lot of these ideas are gonna come up. And the last point is, and this is perhaps my damage control to this, but is that this is not a lecture but a story. And I think there's so many beautiful and interesting points wrapped up into this, especially on a methodological level, speaking about research and ethics and so forth. So I hope that at least one of these things stick out to you and you're able to connect with them. And there is one main point I'd like to get out of this presentation. And it's cheesy, it's cringeworthy, it's a quotable, and I love really snappy quotables, but it's this idea that things 
aren't always what they seem. And if you can keep this in the back of your mind throughout the story, you'll see that it comes over and over and it loops around. So the same things that liberate you can also imprison you. And the things that are capacious can also be dangerous. And I believe that idea to be echoed through this painting. So this is a painting by Picasso and the painting is called, Sci it's titled Science and Charity. And in relatively muted colors, a man lays ill on a bed with a doctor to the left of the painting and to his right, a nun holding a child. This painting is interesting because Picasso was 15 when he made this painting. And as you can see by the colors, the greens and, the, and it's a little bit dim and muted overall, it's a little bit eerie. And what's really interesting is that he painted this two years after the passing of his seven year old sister. And we don't know the relationship, whether he cared for this sister, but usually there's an aspect of care work, especially an emotional care. And under these circumstances, Picasso would be classified a young carer. Even when looking at this painting, I come to this idea again that things aren't always what they seem. And, and there's a host of emotions that are enmeshed through this painting. So, and yeah, and that was the main thing I wanted to get out of here. And it doesn't match with the slides. Okay, perfect. So on this slide here, I have a painting of Jean-Michel Basquiat and it's titled The Self-Portrait. And we see Basquiat here, a black male wearing a red shirt, locks on the head, red eyes and ears and an overall expressionist, almost messy like signature Basquiat style painting. When he was young, he lost an art competition because of his messier style. He lost to someone who drew a perfect Spider-Man. And this identity crisis was an interesting play for him. And I think echoes a lot into my own personal story. So this is how it goes. When I first applied to the communications department, I wanted to do work in fashion design. I had this amazing project that really was cryptic and probably didn't make a lot of sense on blackness and madness and fashion and having all these ideas together. I can say that Shirk rejected me in the first month, so maybe that was a sign. But nonetheless, I, the pandemic happens and all my interests change. And because I like cheesy quotes, I can use it here that I'm going to quote Mike Tyson that everyone has a plan till they get punched in the face. And I got sucker punched, seriously. When the pandemic happened, um, I started to have a whole bunch of family issues. And all these things that were, you know, pushed to the sideline throughout my whole life, they all came to the surface. So amongst family issues, I gained 60 pounds, six zero, a lot. And at that point, fashion didn't matter to me. What really mattered to me was my family and the care relations and the people that were the closest to me. That was the most important thing. And dealing with family members with mental health issues, I started to think about long-term care. And I started to search it up on the Ontario website. It's like $1,800. Um, it's, yeah, it's $1,800 and it's one small shared bedroom. And I was like, wow, like how am I gonna afford this? Is that even like livable conditions? And so many thoughts were racing through my head. I'm also looking at the PhD salary and saying, okay, I need to do something drastic about this. I end up reading this book here. So this book literally changed my life and it's called Children Caring for Parents with Mental Illness, Perspective of Young Carers, Parents and Professionals by Joe Aldrich and Saul Becker, 2003. And in short, this book is a UK based study and it's a, qualitative, it's a qualitative study, and there's quotes from young people themselves. So I'm reading this book, this is my first time, I'm just reading this book to just figure out my lived situation, like how do I navigate this? And I read this book and tears start coming from my eyes. And for two reasons, the first was that I realized that I'm not alone. It took me 24 years to find out that I am not alone. And that was incredibly powerful that there are millions of people in the world who are going through the exact same thing I am. And two, I also found that my lived experience is very statistical. So I had said earlier that I gained a bunch of weight and it was found in the literature that oftentimes young carers 
develop eating disorders, such as binge eating to cope with the stress. And I started to realize like, not in its negative way, but like I was becoming that statistic. I was literally someone in this book. And finding all these issues was a new beginning. I felt as though I finally figured out my purpose. There was a identity called young carers there was a group of people it's really big in the united kingdom but in canada it's a lot smaller from the research perspective but statistics demonstrate that and it varies but there's minimum 1.25 million young carers across canada so I, I figured out that the young carer identity is something incredibly important and as i put here a new beginning and a new beginning. It's an app. So this painting is an abstract um, self portrait with wide brush strokes of green, grays, and cream colors. This was done by Picasso in 1971, which was closer to the end of his life. And if you recall earlier, the first painting was by, by Picasso, and this had a very realism style to it. And later on in his life, around, I, around 70 years later, um, we have a more abstract style and I think that was him or what a lot of theorists say that's him finding his voice and in the same way by finding the younger identity it was me finding my voice. Um, so again, a new beginning and I, most importantly, I could put a name to my experience it wasn't something empty that I was trying to figure out. So my research is on young carers, but as I did the literature review something alarming came up to me. It was, what do I think? Where do I stand in the literature? And as I'm reading more, the first pressing issue arises. Why do people in this book state that, and I quote from this book here, we have on one side, people are saying, being a young carer is a labor of love. It's normal. Whereas on the other side, we have people saying they're confused, angry, fearful, emotionally drained and helpless. I couldn't understand why there was that polarity. Why is there that difference? And in the book, it's not discussed with enough depth. And again, this is from 2003, but so much has, um, so much has developed in critical race theory and intersectional ideas overall. And I found that in situating my own background in critical race theory, that labor of love, that positive experience versus the negative one, a labor of survival, and intersectional analysis belong right there. And because young carer studies is in health sciences, nursing, social work, these very sometimes rigid statistical quantifiable disciplines, the humanities perspective, that cultural theory was really missing from here. And I can point to several examples here that vividly intertwine racialized violence to affective understandings of care work and healthcare. When Audre Lorde, a Black woman, is diagnosed with cancer, received patronizing comments from medical staff, is given very short notice of her surgery after a cancer reoccurrence and not having her pain taken seriously, we can see that she falls into gendered racial tropes of Black women being able to withstand a lot of pain, which this has long histories in chattel slavery, scientific racism, and so forth. And they quote a line from Gina B. Kim here. For Lord, cancer is not an individual property limited to and contained by her body's boundaries, but an extension of state sanction and extra legal systems that seek to delimit, contain, and exploit Black life. Racism does something here, and it has tangible effects. And that is part of me suturing um, that humanity's perspective into that conversation of young carers. Another example is in Lisa Stevenson's work on Inuit communities in Arctic Canada. The main idea is that colonial geographical configurations of these communities makes healthcare incredibly hard to access. I quote here that being transported from a life in Canada's north, either from a small settlement or an ancestral hunting camp, on a land to a hospital where none of the doctors spoke the native language and Inuit patients were largely confined to their beds was an experience of radical disjuncture. And in situations, if we think about it, if we think about it in situations where time is essential to life, thinking about heart attacks, 
seizures, aneurysms. The geographical location is designed to foster Inuit individuals at the excess of normative bodies. And the last example on race and care work is a personal one for me. When police officers came to my apartment four hours after the call to help with a mental health crisis in my home, the aggressive use of handcuffs, the quickness, the speed, the racial capitalistic productivity tropes, especially in a middle low income immigrant community, we see the impact and weight of racism in the conversation of care work. And I quote Shiloh Whitney here and her work on bioproductive labor that these negative experiences on the caregiver collects as harmful and toxic waste. So Whitney gives this beautiful example of a flight attendant. And it's really interesting that um, I, I, I pull out my own example here, but if we have a flight attendant that is handing out Coke and then a customer or a, um, someone on the plane says, I want Pepsi and then they flip her off and you have someone else who does that um, another seat later on, this flight attendant has to still smile. That's part of affective labor. That's part of the job. The problem is, is that those affects that come in, those negative, um, those negative interactions collect like waste and they collect and they collect and they internally rot you, right? And this is something important to think about in the conversation of young carers. So as bridging in race relations with young carers and the negative feelings of confused, angry, fearful, and emotionally drained and helpless, we could link that as rationale that the racist experience of healthcare informed the young carers experience to be negative. And I was trying to tease out why there was that positive, again, the labor of love versus the labor of survival. Why are these two competing sides? And the one rationale I had was through race relations and through economics and so forth. So to recap, the first major point is, again, addressing the labor of love versus the labor of survival. So this brings me to the next point. Um, and I titled this identity and in um, parentheses crisis. And it's a painting by Jean-Michel Basquiat, and it's all blacked out with white eyes. And we can see the outline of his hair, head, and upper torso. And I really like this image for a couple of reasons. The, this image has become one of Basquiat's most popular self-portrait. And it's Basquiat playing with the Black male protagonist at the center of his painting. But interestingly and noteworthy, I have a quote from Basquiat, and he states that, I am not a Black artist, I am an artist. And I think about this a lot, and this will unfold in my conversation about young carers. So, so far in the story, I've created this research project to study racialized young carers. And in particular, I aim to do a twofold methodology, first beginning with a qualitative study where I interview young carers and ask about their lived experience and narratives, and then an autoethnography, where I recount my own lived experience as a racialized young carer. So as I'm preparing this proposal, I'm journaling my experiences, and I make an absolutely striking realization. I don't think I'm actually comfortable speaking about my lived experience. How will I even find racialized young carers, let alone would they be willing to speak about their own lived experience? Young carers is not a thing here in Canada. There's a growing body of work that's happening, but it's still so, so small. And, but in asking people about their family situations, it's so private, it's so taboo that I was reminded by this quote and I had such a hard time trying to grapple with it. So this is a painting by Audrey. This is a painting of Audrey Lord on a green background with the words, your silence will not protect you. And I had incredibly, I had an incredibly difficult time reconciling with this. If I don't share my story on one hand, am I letting down millions of racialized young carers? But on the other side, if I do share my story, what harm am I causing to my own family? And this ethical dilemma sat with me. It's on the top of my journal, and I still think about it to this day. 
because in the beginning, I raved over this identity of being a young carer. I thought it was the best thing that happened to me. I teared up over it reading this book right here. It did change my life, but somehow things aren't always what they seem. And I started to realize that a lot of the silence, especially in racialized communities, which are historically already surveyed by the state and state-like institutions, may not be because of a lack of information, though it could be. But what happens when we make people an object of sociological analysis? By saying racialized young carers, I'm throwing these young people into an identity. And it could be capacious and liberating and life-changing as it was for me in the beginning, but it could also be dangerous at the exact same time. And I glean from Franz Fanon here that, and Franz Fanon is one of the most prolific theorists in critical Black studies, who describes life as a Black man and the corporeal schema of, the corporeal schema that is attached to his skin color. And he says that there's histories woven into your skin. And he famously states this idea that, where shall I hide? And I love that idea so much because as I think a lot now about this idea, if I was to attach the young carer identity to racialized families, especially with many differing cultures and family traditions, the spotlight may create more harm. And this was a really interesting paradox that I've been dealing with overall. And I come back to this, um, the painting, if you recall earlier by Basquiat, where he says that, I'm not a black artist, I'm an artist. I wondered to myself that like, where do I stand in that? Am I a racialized young carer or I am just a young carer? And even if that identity plays, like what exactly am I saying when I'm attaching that identity? So then I ask here in the conversation of racialized young carers, by me using that identity, where shall they hide? And on the other side, where shall I hide? Hiding and the politics of visibility, or rather invisible, invisibility, potentially saved my family. There are many citations that young carers fear that their parents would get taken away, or they themselves might even get taken away. And I have three quotes here that, and two come from this book, but it states that it's more of a family secret. It's not my story to tell. I have to say, I'm fairly certain that we would have lied through our teeth to keep our mom safe and to not, you know, the fears in our minds, we would have been where we're going to get taken away or Lord knows where we're going to go. That was from an actual young carrot who was interviewed in this book. Um, and I actually have family members who've had their kids taken away put into foster care and has absolutely traumatized not just them, but our entire family. And 10 years later, we're still trying to cope with that. We're still doing that on damage. We're still undoing that damage. So by allowing the state into our home has been nothing but violence. How can I dare say everyone should implement that identity for young carers for racialized families? And therefore, at the same time with the young carer identity, invisibility is capacious, liberating, and life-changing, but can also be dangerous at the exact same time. I come back to this quote that I said earlier that things aren't always what they seem. And to conclude here and address Audre Lorde's comment, in that I think you can be very loud and audacious without showing all your cards. After conversations with my supervisor, Arceli, I realized that I already started the research process, though I'm still in the proposal phase. And if I asked racialized young carers and they refuse to be interviewed, refusal is anything but failure. In fact, that's actually a political stance. And 
If that is the result of my interview process, it is absolutely a concrete finding. In Audra Simpson's ethnographic study in Kanawake, she speaks of the ethnographic limit that is encountered when the participants refuse to answer particular questions. Simpson writes that the limit was arrived at when the representation would bite all of us and compromise the representational territory that has, be that has been gained in the past hundred years. And in my way of reconciling it, but not even reconciling is not the correct word, in my way of bringing Audrey Lord's ideas together is that silence and visibility are not the same. I had to be very careful that care work and family relations has long been theorized through critical race scholars. There's an enormous history of this. And most importantly is that this is a new field of study, the field of young carers. And absolutely awareness needs to be raised for young carers. But as the research unfolds, we'll have to start being mindful of the issues I've mentioned on race and the state of being capacious and dangerous at the exact same time. Because again, things aren't always what they seem. That's the end. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shikara. Thank you. I will stop sharing the PowerPoint and then I will be able to pin. Um, here. So. so that sounds that sounds okay. Okay, I think we're all set up. So we will hear a uh, commentary by Arceli. Document. 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 Thank you. Um, thank you, first of all, Nicholas, for this amazing and um, lively and so personal and uh, energetic, energetic presentation. I, I really enjoyed um, how you embody your work uh, in person and um a lot of talks there and i can you're almost performing where you are at um in your phd journey right now questioning and exploring so many different ideas so many different concepts questions issues like mapping different terrains ranging from pictures and paintings to um like quotes from autoethnographies <clears throat> and i think that's great so that's just simply great um I was wondering, like you, you gave us a lot to think about and, and to think together with you. And I'll just do that. And this is something that has come up again and again in our conversations and I'll just bring it up again. Um, because you're really uh, trying to push that idea somewhere here. And I wonder where it will go later on. This identity category of young carers, um, categories like um, scholars say in, and this is a big discussion in science and technology studies, like this idea of categories and concepts. What do they do? How do they function? Um, they act like um, they have um, certain affordances, these categories, affordances that are not always good, that can be also harmful and dangerous, which you are pointing out. And in other aspects, affordances can also be helpful, all depending on the situation and the specificities of where those categories are mobilized, by whom, to what, and in which, under which context. So I, I'm really um, amazed by all these complexities around the category of young carers. Depending on who uses, who uses it in under what context, it becomes something else. For instance, if it's used by sociologists doing this um, like um, very scientific research, it becomes something statisticized and something becomes that something that can be acted upon by researchers themselves, something that could also be pulled from research to social policy analysis, health statistic, et cetera, which will end up affecting people's lives. It could be something that you as yourself 
who, as you stated, you were looking for, like you, you yourself was in a journey and you were looking for some answers. And this idea of young care came up like almost like a revelation, almost like a rescue to you that you kind of benefited from identifying with it, which right now you're, you're kind of questioning as well. And, and it might be doing some other things as well, like some other um, functions in other contexts. So I wonder if you could reflect on those um, different um, offerings, sometimes dangerous, sometimes helpful, that this idea of young carers provide and um, what does it do? And what do, you do, what do you plan to do with all those ambivalences around this category? And I know it's a, it's a hard question, but just your thoughts in whatever shape or form they come to your head. Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Arceli. I think that, like you said, this kind of question that was coming up a lot, and it's interesting that when I first started, I thought that it was just the best category, and now it's like, it's sort of shifting. And like you were saying, it's like the affordances that they could offer. What I was thinking was that um, it's helpful in the way of like policy. Right. And I think that especially like what I had mentioned earlier, that using it as the age of 18 years old is helpful because that's kind of like this idea of 18, you're becoming an adult, like in that, that area. So I think it's helpful for social policy. And I think that especially in Canada, as it's not um, that big yet, maybe having very um, rigid may not be the right word, but having these categories that follow um, the United Kingdom, for instance, to implement this into policy would be helpful. But I think that in the, there's something about like when I enter race into that conversation, it does something there. And I'm, I'm at like the crossroads of like, to, to answer your question, I don't know, I don't have the, the answer, but like, there's something, Arceli, I think you point out something really interesting there that um, there's definitely how I'm going to manage with it. And I think that perhaps more reading is important, but also like actually doing the research. And what I hope is, once I start interviewing people, or if I get people, um, these ideas will become um, more visible. But between that policy iteration of young carers and the humanities one, and like the identity and like how it serves, I don't, I don't actually have the question. I feel like at the beginning, I had a solid answer, and now I'm even more confused, but in a good way, in a way that like I feel like something is happening, and I need to like that happening. I need to like write more on it and think about it. If that sort of answers your question. Oh, it does. It's I, I really like this um, like meanderings that you're going through. That I think that will be really helpful. That you don't take any any idea or category and concept for granted, but you travel with it and see where it goes and where it will take you. Um, I was also wondering. In I mean, this something that comes up very strong in your work. Um, you have been questioning this idea of visibility, invisibility, like, um, and there's often this assumption in, uh, in like, um, certain types of research and um, even like political activism that visibility is always a good thing, that there should be awareness around something that, you know, people, um, something that, that a watch that was entire to unknown should be like put into the foreground. Which you're like, um, there have been, of course, um, critical uh, readings of such approaches, especially in critical race theory. And I really appreciate the way how you're also like um, critically approaching that. And like visibility itself can come um, with its own risks and dangers. Um, and at that point will be, um, and also the idea of recognition, right? Recognition can also be dangerous uh, to be recognized uh, within a particular category. I wonder, and that will be probably one of the primary challenges that you will face when you go into the field during your interviews, how will you negotiate that ethical boundary? Like, um, and thankfully we have concepts like refusals from Audrey Simpson. Um, we know that refusals can happen in the field. And I wonder, and this is a question I also ask myself, what are our limits, our researchers ethically in the field um, when something, uh, when some boundaries must not be crossed in the sense that um, uh, research become, can become itself um, dangerous, uh, whether we intended or not. And how can we 
like how do you see yourself negotiating that boundary with your potential participants? Um, like what um, solutions or strategies would you have in your pocket as you go to the field? Um, maybe turning this into a more dialogical process with your interviewees or maybe, um, or maybe something else. So I wonder if you are like already foreseeing some strategies for that, not to act like infantilizing or protecting people, but more like um, having this self-reflexivity and recognizing our own boundaries as researchers and what not must be crossed in the field. Yeah, thank you for that, Arcel. It's a huge, huge question. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot, it, even in the conversation of like trust, um, because like I had mentioned that um, have in, our, in already surveyed um, communities, um, what happens when I go in and I add an another layer of surveillance and how do I navigate that? Mm. I think the one thing that like, I haven't thought this through um, well enough, but the one thing that I was thinking of, like sharing my story, but like, I'm even like, um, do I have to be careful in the way I do that? I, I can't be like, I'm a young carer, this is my story, and you should be a young carer too, because that's kind of like what I'm challenging right here. Like, I don't even know if like that young carer term in the way I want to use it. Um, and I think just making, the one thing that I was thinking through it was that like, that word of like counter narratives and narratives and focusing on the story. And I think that if I focused there, that this is a story and that would be my way into building trust and to building, um, to navigating that conversation. But Arcel, you ask a really important question. Um, it, it, it's incredibly important, like the bounds. Like I, I see what you're saying that those bounds and how do I um, navigate that? It's something that I need to definitely think about more for sure. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. And that could be something really generative and productive around that questioning um, for yourself as, as well as for the research that um, what do we do with those boundaries? And that could be some literature in like um, research on undocumented migrants, like there are also like um, some questioning around those boundaries as well, especially work on indigenous, indigenous communities that you can find alliances with, um, even if they are not necessarily your um, topic of research. Um, that will be something interesting to explore, um, along with many, so many other things. Um, I am also looking at the time, and I know that uh, we will also open up the floor for questions. Is, is that correct, Christiana? Yes, well, we have uh, a lot of time. We have up, up until 1.30, so if you have uh, Anything else to add, uh, please feel free. Okay, um, thank you so much. So I would still open up the uh, floor for questions. So this is more like, um, this can be a more informal space and we can collectively uh, think together and also like um, um, make sense of what we are hearing and process and also help Nicholas think through the, some of the issues. And um, so I, I, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hands. I don't see the, um, the actual room, but if, if there's someone, I, I will assume that they'll just go ahead. And if you're in the chat, you can also write it. If you're on the Zoom, you can write it either in chat or by raising your hands, please. Um, and I will read them for you if you write them in the chat. So we have a question here from Kobe. You don't know if you can't see no, me. No, you have to be here in okay. order for us to see you. Right. Or, or you can like stand in front of the camera. <laughs> no, no, I don't think it will work. Oh, okay. Hello. Oh. So if this were, I'll keep pushing. <laughs> I'll keep my mask on. So thank you very much. And thank you, Arcelli. And I'm really glad to hear I came today for all the reasons, but particularly how our projects resonate, I feel. So that's the gift of the fellowships. Um, yeah, that's the point. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, and the then the embodiment of it. Of it. I mean, I've worked with our Sally before, so it's beautiful to hear your lens through, um, like what we're bringing as researchers to these. Um, I don't want to say delicate, but rather like fragile um, experiences, and also reflections for ourselves in doing the work. So that's something I love about story, <laughs> and I and I. Thank you for that. Maybe I'll just highlight some things before getting to a question because I feel we're touching on them already. 
So um, exactly as you spoke to and has been brought up, like the politics of visibility and visibility and how that, like in given settings, it is or isn't a choice. And I was curious about that for you, like where you find agency with making that choice where you, where it's taken from you, because certainly like the choice to be part of a PhD, as much as it is a choice, I heard you speak to tactics of like salary and funding available. And then the other side, um, which I also feel in terms of uh, alliances with either activism or communities we care for being, um, you know, who am I performing for or performing to when I'm delivering this research? And that's where I think performance becomes a really interesting field in what it can do for you or how it can serve you. For example, like how we are presenting ourselves in whatever given space, how you're using the format of a presentation to kind of reclaim how that story can be told, the structure, the slides, like I was celebrating all of that because it's, you know, it's both fun to deconstruct, but also to um, rebuild the, the, the pieces to how you pull this together. And you chose artworks today, right? Which are um, symbolic, but also given the time frames, really historical markers of like how we tell story. So I was just interested in performance as a method and maybe something that might serve you or that you already work with because I feel and I hear like such a storyteller when you when you speak, you know, and how there's room in there for, um, you know, maybe allegory and myth and code <laughs> switching and all these things that that might give some sites of resistance that become interesting for the, for the methods you're discussing. Uh, and then I was just curious, because it's part of my own work, also in my second year of the PhD, so maybe that's why it resonates, of this idea as paradox. And, and maybe this is implied in, in the way you structured your talk, that paradox, paradox can be a, a site of fertility as well. So it's like painful, it feels, as, as a researcher or in relationships with, with because um, I do collaborative research, so folks we work with, um, it's like things are imposed on us and also these contested areas become like those boundaries are things that you can push both in the learning but also in the definitions or the categories. I guess I was wondering pragmatically would young cares become basically a site of intervention that this was productive for you and so you don't lose that piece as I was hearing ourselves say as in it resonates with me to be like oh someone else lived this too and I'm bawling because there's an act of being seen in that, right? But then there's the not enoughness, which potentially with whoever you will be speaking with and maybe having collective conversations with, is there also a desire and a leadership that, that can come through for how young cares is not enough? It's a departure point for um, either representation or eventually policy that is needed in, in this giant matrix of race and race race and racialized violence is, is what I would point about. So opportunities, I guess, with these um, tools and some of them that I feel you're already tapping into with like how you deliver the work, which is so important. Any of that if it's productive <laughs> for you. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I have uh I can like as you were speaking, like so many ideas like flashed. I wrote through. it all down. That's yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. And like one thing that really stuck out to me because it's such a like colloquial slang word like code switching mm -hmm. and I love that and like I was reminded of like some of the disability literature that like um having that um having that disability also allows you to get funding it also mm -hmm. allows you to get um sort of access to medical benefits and things like that so in that way it's like capacious right mm -hmm. um it's a that's a very interesting um idea and I haven't thought about it through performance, that's really interesting, and I th I think it's really, and like I'm I'm thinking as I'm thinking through it, like young carers as an identity is helpful in terms of funding, but like in what way can that be played on, and using that as something bigger? Like it, there's just so many ideas there that it's hard for me to like really piece together. But like, yeah, thank you for that. It's really interesting. All right. And hearing you, can I just reprompt the paradox? Thing? Yes. Is please. there anything there? You know, we talked about, and I heard you say how it's re restrictive, but is there any place there that becomes like, again, there's possibility for movement, for pushing back? Is, is there a way that it feels like an opportunity for you as well? The paradox of harm versus uh, visibility with this research. Yeah. 
it's something I would have to think through yeah, a little bit more. Good. But like, no, it's just really good. I point. have the same question. That's <laughs> why. <laughs> Does somebody have the answer? Yeah, um, that paradox. Like, is that I? That's you. You use the word opportunity. Question and, mark. Right, the opportunity happening right there. Okay, we'll I, keep I talking. Yeah. <laughs> so we have two other questions, uh, and also thank in the you. chat, so um, Jesse Arsenault uh, uh, just congratulates you for your talk, but uh, he had to leave. But now we have two questions, one from Ella Amir. Thank you. I'm also from Army Quebec, <clears throat> and thank you, Nicolas, for this presentation. I love storytelling, and I think that this is probably what um, comes across um, very often more interestingly than, you know, hard data. But, you know, I was really very curious as, and I, I have to honestly admit that I didn't really think about it before. Um, as you have heard, we have been very interested in young carers for the past couple of years, and uh, Oliver, is really helping us to, you know, to push it forward. I really wonder, I'm really intrigued by, you know, we all have many identities. Young care ring is just one identity. And I wonder if this could be a question or some way to try to explore the, you know, multi identities young carers have how young caring is woven or interwoven within other identities and what is the impact of it? I mean, like, you know, we, are, we have been talking about young caring and we know that there is, it's, it, there are benefits on one hand, but there are many risk factors on the other. So, you know, we have a sense of what, um, what are some of the outcomes, especially for young carers, uh, especially if they are not properly supported. But I think that, you know, from their perspective, it would, it seems to me that it would be really interesting to see how they are experiencing their different kinds of identities and how do they affect each other. Yeah, um, I could add on to that because I think it's, it's just incredibly important. And I think that perhaps is something that in my research I need to um, highlight more because like I remember reading this one article and it was speaking about um, a caregiver who had um, two mothers and what happens how does that change the dynamic versus having um, um, a, a father and a mother and like so even like that little nuance created such a big difference I wonder if like there's just so much there and I think that's a brilliant point in like in the way it's interwoven with others and I think that from what I've read in the research there's like that intersectional like thought to really bring these ideas together and to consider race to consider um, um, sexuality to consider all these different things together is really um, I think like going to make the research really strong and it's something that needs to be um, take it into consideration. So I, I thank you very much for that point. It's something that I will know. Thank you. We also have a question from Oliver uh, Fitzpatrick. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, a lot of things. Um, I, I love that you ground this in storytelling because that's kind of the way that I've gone forward with it. I think too, just in the spirit of visual descriptions and things as a blonde haired, blue eyed, white mask presenting person, you know, I get to tell my stories and have my stories accepted in a way that is founded on privilege that I have. And that's kind of top of my mind too, when you're thinking about engaging with a wider diversity of young carers and asking them to share their stories. I know from my personal experience, how hard it is to do that too. And then you look at where your positionality is and you go, it's gonna be very difficult to get them to share. Um, the thing that really stood out for me and the main thought that I've been thinking about and wanna kind of talk about is how do you not pathologize the act of caring? You know, cause that's what you're talking about. We don't want young carers to become a diagnosis that can be weaponized against people, especially in a country that has a history of, you know, forced removal of children from families in a systemic and racialized way. So I think that there, 
I was really happy with the kind of grounding that you're coming from, you know, coming from a critical disability lens, coming from critical race theory. Um, there's such a wealth of practices that are maybe more participatory, that value different knowledges, that value um, different perspectives that then allow you to not over-medicalize um, something that's very human and something that's very, again, culturally rooted. Um, just to kind of bring it all together, I think um, I'm really curious to see if somebody could look at cultural interpretations of what caring means to try and help us define where that boundary is and to be able to prevent it from ever becoming something that's looked at as a, as a bad thing, something that's looked at maybe a little bit more like an impairment in the social model of disability, where it's about where that care, again, meets a system and whether it's supported or um, used as a tool to perpetuate violence against uh, marginalized groups. Yeah, um, such a brilliant comment. And thank you so much for that. I think that there was one thing in the back of my mind, especially as I wrote the ending for this presentation. And it was that I know that young carers work, it needs that, um, that awareness. And I, I was very cognizant not to make it seem that like, no, we don't need that awareness. Like, like because it's so important. And I described that, like, it literally changed my life. And I think that this is such an important conversation of like that pathology that's happening and how to not make it as like, I think you said it perfectly as like a medical diagnosis. I think that that's um, something that I have to ponder on a little bit more and think through how we can use the identity as like a site of empowerment and as a site of, um, as, as a site that doesn't slip into um, very like colonial, like racist, these kind of gestures. I think that that was kind of what I was getting to at the end that like, um, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of research done, but then we need to push it a step for, further and think um, how we can manage these things. Cause I think it was, yeah, I just think that it's such an important comment. I wrote down pathology because it's something that I have to try and battle with. And like, where do I stand in this conversation um, right now at the moment? It's, a, it's a, like, I definitely still view myself as a young carer but I need to tread lightly. Like I, I, I have to think about it more. And I didn't want it to make it seem as such like, as a taken for granted concept, because again, coming from that critical race perspective, uh, it's hard to unsee all the violence that has already happened. It's hard to unsee that. And so then like, I tread lightly in that way, but I also realize how it's, the young care identity is capacious, but also dangerous at the same time. Like that kind of thing that I was getting at. So yeah, thank you so much for that comment. Thank you. We also have two uh, other people uh, raising their, hand, uh, their hands online. Uh, first, we'll go with Rosie Polly. Well, hello, everyone, and hello, Nicholas. Um, what a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm a member of the public, and I found this uh, via Oliver. So Twitter is a great place to find chronic caregivers. We're on there. Um, so yeah, I have the lived experience of being a young carer, um, but I identify as a chronic caregiver because uh, my mom is chronically ill. And so I think there's going to be some interesting identity work within those labels as well. But I just, before I get into a couple of ideas um, that I was considering, I just want to say that I am certain that this work is going to be incredibly critical moving forward. You and I are in the same generation and I'm so excited to be here for the beginning of this. This is so wonderful. Um, so thank you. Um, and Ella, I, I can't wait to um, look more into the work that you do and same with you, Oliver. I'm, I'm thrilled to, to have discovered you this week. <laughs> so um a couple of things so when i say chronic caregiver my mom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when i was 10 years old um and i understand you know i am a i'm a white female speaking speaking to this but the length of time that a young care has been caregiving may factor in maybe a data point to really consider here 
and the differentiation between acute chronic or acute caregiving versus chronic. It's quite different lived experiences. So just a thought on that front. Um, and then also I have an online community for humans who love and care for chronically ill family members, chosen family included. And um, we have a very diverse group. So perhaps there could be a participant within that community. Um, so I was thinking that as well, but what a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, thank you so much for your comments, yeah, Rosie. And um, please, yeah, let's connect. I can, uh, I definitely want to throw my email on the chat and we can connect. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, please put that email. I'll, I'll take will care of gladly it. Do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So um, we have also Amy Mazowita who had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, and great pronunciation of my last name. It's often mispronounced. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just, first of all, Nick, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this presentation. Um, like for those that don't know, Nick and I are, have, are in the same department and kind of been going through uh, the process of the PhD alongside each other under our CELI's supervision. So it's really just been wonderful to see your project progress to this point. And um, yeah, I'm just really proud to know you and to be here today and, and to hear your amazing work. Um, this might be echoing some of the other comments that were already shared today, but I wanted to just bring up how much I appreciate the perspective of storytelling that you're getting at. Um, like I know in my own work, I often kind of go back in my head to this idea of like answering questions and get caught up in that, but I really love that you're kind of, you know, maybe moving away for that from that in a way and kind of not trying to maybe provide answers through your research, but just telling people stories, which in the end, I think will provide those answers. So I think that's just wonderful. Um, the kind of question I have, and it's maybe kind of half formed at this point, um, and I'm kind of speaking from my own experience as well. And um, I know my camera off, but I, you know, I'm a, a white skinned, blonde haired, um, female presenting or identifying woman. So I definitely don't have that perspective of like the racialized young carer. Um, but I do have some experience with caring for a mentally ill parent. I know you and I have kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, and I'm just thinking through like my own experience of like applying for grants and only recently have I kind of started telling that story uh, or my own story and how I kind of relate to my own research around mental health. And I had someone in previous years that was reading one of my grant applications that kind of questioned whether or not I should share that information and that, you know, maybe the, the readers of that application might question whether I because I have that care relationship with my parent, if I have the time to put into my research, if I have the, you know, can create that distance or if my care position would kind of um, take up too much of my, of my energy and time that could be taken from the research. So I guess what I'm wondering is how you kind of think about um, not only like the dangers of pathologizing care work, like um, Olivia, or Oliver, sorry, was saying, but also just like institutionally or in your own life and how you kind of might confront some of these dichotomies between being very well positioned to take on this work as someone who has lived that experience, but then also maybe having pushback from, you know, the institution or other bodies about having the capacity to take it on because you're caught up in that role, if that makes sense. Um, sorry, I know I kind of stumbled over that a little bit. I don't know if it's a clear question, um, but it's just if you have any thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, thank you for that, Amy. And thank you for coming to this conversation. Um, I think that one thing that I could highlight in the young carers literature is that, um, especially in this book here, um, oftentimes um, mental illness, depending on um, what kind of mental illness it is, it doesn't um, happen all year round. It's usually very cyclical. And I think like even that gives you, um, it, it seems to me that like, like even in the way it's positioned that the university has like so much power over you that like they, that, you know, you can't, um, you can't do work because of that care responsibility. It seems a little ridiculous to me in that conversation. But I think, Amy, I think it's a very important question. And like, even, um, outside of the university, like my own personal self is, how would I deal with that? If a situation where um, the mental illness comes back and comes full fledged, I think that all it is, and I think that it's really important to like, 
throughout self-care. Like I really want to throw it out there too, but also like, because I'm doing an autoethnography and I'm journaling um, a lot of my experiences, I think that it was a way like journaling as also like a cathartic way of expressing myself, but also like keeping track of these ideas to me would be the, um, the one way to like circumvent that. And I also um, haven't went through the ethics um, part yet. So when I go through that this summer, I think that Amy, your question is going to come up indefinitely. And that was, that's a beast that I'm going to have to address while I get there. Um, and I want to make one um, comment here that I found really interesting in terms of ethics that um, I read this beautiful article that spoke about um, this, this individual who had an adopted child. And like by me, by them speaking about that adopted child, do they need to get ethics? You know, like mm. how do I, mm. when I'm speaking about my story, if I have um, for my disabled mother, um, do I have to get the ethics passed through that? Because though I'm sharing my story, I'm also sharing someone else's story. It doesn't exist in itself. Um, so it's something that I, I think about so, so much. And it actually makes me really uncomfortable to like even think about there. But I think having to go to that spot and like um, journaling the whole process is like, the one way to deal with that. And I think also working with Arcelli and like managing those things. So thank you so much for that question, Amy. So we have another question by Bengi. Well, not, not a question, more like a commentary. But um, <clears throat> first, I, I mean, and I'm, I'm coming into this again, I kind of say it every time I make a commentary, but more like a feminist political economist who has worked or read on um, care work. So it's gonna be like, we're kind of coming at it from very different perspectives. And I think that's like the cool thing about the center, right? It's like, it's more kind of interdisciplinary topic-based discussions. Um, one thing I wanted to say, kind of following with a, the conversation you were having with Amy, uh, and also I think what Rosie brought up about chronic versus acute, um, the kind of the, the um, another paradox or like kind of what makes care work such a particular form of work and care worker and, and kind of gives care workers a very particular kind of vulnerability is as we've been kind of discussing, it's a, it's a kind of work that's dictated by the needs uh, on and like whose spatiality and temporality is dictated by someone other than yourself. And it's very embodied and it's kind of, it's the biological kind of rhythms that sometimes dictate it. And it's, so basically if we're not, like if you kind of talk about, if you think about childcare, you cannot feed your kid like five times in the morning and then like expect not to feed them, right? Um, so it's, it's so kind of out of your, like how to organize the space or time of it is so out of your control you're kind of, it's very hard to kind of, it makes it, it gives you another kind of vulnerability. So this is, I think like something that you were talking about with Amy in terms of like when, so it's cyclical, it's not kind of, so that's part of it, right? You don't know when you will be needed as well. Um, and it kind of, I think it makes it uh, a different kind, it makes it open to a different kind of vulnerability. The second thing, I was thinking as you were talking about is um, kind of with the paradox of between the labor of love and labor of survival that you were talking about, maybe um, in order to kind of maybe grapple with it, that maybe you can look at more like the, the, the more ethnographic and anthropological work more generally about care work because the same kind of paradox is I think is an um, is a kind of a cross-cutting paradox of the, all kinds of care work, and when, you, when we see it more crystallized around, oh, like it should be done out of love, it should be done in like intrinsically by by people who are intrinsically motivated, and then kind of that becoming in a way weaponized to not adequately compensate or recognize care workers, right? Uh, this is. Kind of this is more it has been a discussion in the context of more commodified care work so care, like commodified or like paid care work in the context of like uh healthcare or child care that like the one that kind of 
the good nurses, for instance, are the ones who have an intrinsic motivation to uh, to care for people. So if we start paying decent wages to nurses, we're going to have people like do nursing who are not necessarily intrinsically motivated, but just doing it for the money. So it's going to kind of so there's like an I think like the, there are different ways in which this paradox works out at different scales in kind of public policy, but I think at the very heart of like the young care workers uh, and their silence as well. So I'm going to kind of tie that to the to the kind of silence or how to like talk about it in research and methodology. I think I think it was Oliver who brought it up, even like the definition of what constitutes care work differs, right? It differs across cultures. I mean, some of the kind of stuff that we're talking about as work is like kind of almost like immoral to talk about as work in certain cultural settings. It's like, it's your duty. Uh, so it kind of works to erase the very kind of labor that is involved in it. And that adds to the silence. So it's not only that it's very private, it's very, it could be like um, domed with like, or it could be associated with feelings of shame, but it's also not, I mean, it's also even like a challenge to, 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 to describe it or identify it as work. So, and it's, I think it would add to the silence. I mean, this is, and it would add to even like organize a collective, or collectively organizing care workers uh, to even like demand certain uh, certain kinds of protections or certain types of uh, whatever they deem, because it's so kind of uh, implicated with like shame, but also like it's not even work. Why do we even talk about it? Uh, kind of there's I think a, a, a dimension there. Um, and I feel like your like your research going forward could even like be more, um, I mean, it might turn out that you will talk about that kind of the identity and the silence and like what enables one to speak and what what disables one to speak in this context, which, and like kind of also like how do care workers actually play with these categories that are silly brought up? Like, do they find them useful or do they blur them? Like, how do they use it? Like, what's their agency in terms of of like knowledge production categories and like maybe they use it in very innovative uh, ways that kind of work for them. So I'm uh, I'm very excited to see how it's going, all gonna turn out. Hope uh, I hope you kind of keep the center in the loop when you're like when you go on doing your research. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. I wrote down like a whole bunch of notes here and like it was really interesting, but I see like almost everyone's comment, like really intersecting, like when you were describing um, Arcelli's comment um, about that boundary and like that agency. And then like, even with the play um, that was mentioned earlier, like so many things are happening here. And um, I enjoyed the term, um, enjoy is not the right word, but like the term um, chronic caregiver in that conversation, like how there, there's just so much to think here, um, to think about here, but it's helpful because it allows me to like pivot in different ways. So thank you so much, everyone, for all your comments. Seriously, it helped. Well, thank you for your very thoughtful offering. Do we still have time or is it done? <laughs> uh, we still have technically 10 more minutes to just yeah. chat or like questions or comments. If I may, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Of course you <laughs> it's, a, no. it's a question that comes really from lived experience because mm -hmm. I got diagnosed with cancer in 2019 and I was living with roommates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my primary caregivers were actually two guys who were my roommates. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, really, I really felt uh, vulnerable, vulnerable, ashamed, uh, needy, uh, and stuff like that. And it's really hard to be on the receiving end of care. So I was wondering in your research, if you also look at the people who are receiving the, the care and how do, uh, the, uh, how do they deal uh, with, with that part? Also, the, you, you, did, you, you did not include the uh, the gender perspective in your uh, in your uh, approach, but I, I I 
I'm wondering if usually young carers are mostly uh, women or if it's uh, half and half, or do you have the statistic about that? Yes. Because, so, okay, just to, to yeah. wrap it up, what I meant is that when I had uh, my friends uh, were women coming at my place, I had no problem mm -hmm. with them helping me. I was just not comfortable when they were these two guys taking care of my like, breast surgery. <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard for me, that uh, gender perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, Christian, thank <laughs> you so much for sharing that with us. Um, it, there's absolutely a gender dynamic to it. Um, it is mostly women. Mostly women? Yeah, okay. it is mostly women. Um, usually in, usually in, um, in qualitative studies, it's almost like 85% like women. Wow. Oh, wow. Usually okay. men. And it's, it's really interesting that you say that because oftentimes men will take care of the grandfather or their friends okay. whereas like women will kind of like just take care of a lot of people and like it's it just it's such a long history um there was a really beautiful paper um written um about this and like talking about like from child care labor into that being downloaded into um it, it's just, it's absolutely very gendered and i think okay. that in this presentation like in my papers like i definitely talk about that um and yeah, so to answer the other question, um, to speak about people receiving care, in this project, I'm not speaking about people who are receiving care, and it's something perhaps I should revisit, but the reason for that was that I found that um, from that disability per, like, perspective, um, especially like, as a like, reading in critical disability studies, um, those like, voices are there, but I find that the young carers is really what's missing. And I wonder if that, like, if I extend into um, the people receiving care, if that's just too much for this mm -hmm. PhD yeah. project, mm -hmm. and maybe that's something afterwards. Um, that is like my only one thing about mm -hmm. that. But yeah, thank you so much for yeah. your comment. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else online? I think maybe. Mama? Mama? Yeah, if there's no one else. I can. Um... Just on the, the gendered point, it's something that we're really looking at right now is because I think that our best kind of quantitative picture of young caring in Canada, we look at that and we know that it seems that there's at the youngest age, not as much of a gender divide. And then that gender divide grows and grows. The more, you know, as a person living in the world, the more that those kids are then socialized into gender roles until you get up to the age of 25 and actually a majority of all young carers in Canada are young women who are in common law or marriages and so it, it to me is so indicative of it being a very gendered sort of concept right um it's fascinating and then the other aspect and I think it's again related to this question of whether to include people who receive the care. Um, I'm really fascinated by the ideas of sort of interdependence um, in relationships, in particular in queer and in disabled relationships. I think that there's such a different concept Like we think about chosen family. Um, and that's where most of the care that I've provided in my life has taken place, right? Um, so I think that as much as it's outside the scope for sure to really get the input from people receiving care, I am really conscious myself of like not alienating that community, also, you know, especially the disability community because there's that tension between even um, you know parents who started a lot of the movements, but then lost their way and there needed to be a major course correction. Um, there's so many different aspects to consider, but it's definitely one that's top of my mind is just to make sure that we're not advocating for caregivers in a way that sort of um, vilifies the, the people that they care for. Thank you. So we still have another five minutes. Uh, will he, do you want to add something, Bram? Yeah, but um, a lot of the commentators already uh, made some of the points I wanted to make. But um, yeah, this was really amazing because you're talking about something that's 
very unintellectualized and non-verbalized in my life because um, I was a young carer. I'm not that young anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I continue and I continue to be a carer with for various other people. But sort of like I was born into, I think, caring because it, it was in my family. It was a sibling, um, a high support needs a disabled person, and then wh whom I had the privilege of um, caring for. And um, I was also going to bring up interdependence because um, when you're talking about young carers, you're talking about people, you know, who are caring for their parents who have cared for them and who are caring for them at the same time. Um, but I was wondering, I, I never came into that identity of uh, young carer, so I was kind of like crying a little when you, <laughs> when you talked about your experience. And thank you so much, Rosie, for the term uh, chronic carer, because I think that's uh, sort of like what I am and what, I, what my life is at the same time. And it sort of like informs my own research uh, in, in a kind of silent way. It, it forms the core of my research, but it's not there necessarily as, you know, uh, intellectualized and um, verbalized. Um, so I was thinking that um, this um, question about identity, uh, it's maybe um, thinking about temporality can help you get through that, you know, is this, an idea, is this a constrictive or a liberating position because um, of, of sort of my own position, I mean, you're, you're going to be a not so young carer <laughs> soon <laughs> and you will care for other people and other people will care for you. Um, and again, in terms of um, this um, maybe paradox between this, you know, labor of love and labor of survival, I think there's a difference between a paradox and a contradiction. And a paradox is the one that's supposed to be unresolvable, but a contradiction is sort of like supposed to be the more productive one. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is a very uh, productive contradiction. And maybe you can add like another uh, sort of like truism to one of the truisms you said, you know, things are not what they seem and two things can be true at the same time. So, um, and um, I really appreciated Bengi's comments too, because in that sense, um, you can sort of maybe find a way uh, Sort of like uh, I'm always thinking of dialectics, <laughs> but like intersectionality and um, and the way in which like what makes this a labor of survival, but also what makes it uh, a labor of love, and maybe they're not the same things. Um, so that might be helpful. I think these are categories that are in motion, and um, because we are in motion as well, we're we're carers, and we we also need care like what we were talking about last time uh, with my talk like who, who reproduces their producers who who takes care of the caretakers so maybe you can think about it in in this like loop that's productive rather than like it's it's a virtuous cycle not a sort of like a vicious cycle um yeah those are some of my folks i'm yeah i'm, I'm very moved uh, by your research so i yeah I can't find any more intellectual thoughts, but thank you so much for doing it. Yeah, thank you. And I think I can make one final point here that um, even your comment that with, with what Oliver was saying before, like just interdependence is so important. Like one key finding in the research that I always come back to is that like, it's very rare that um, a disabled parent will completely drop their caring responsibility. It's mm -hmm. very, very rare to, for that to happen. And that is like, even in like the disability justice framework, like really empowering that person. I think it's so, so, so important that like, even me, this is um, a criticism that I've received before that like, when I say like labor of love and labor of survival, maybe it's not like this far, maybe it's something like this, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then like, it can go back and forth, right? Like it's like, there's, there's so many movements, however we um, to do. So there's definitely some things I want to think, think through there and Thank you so much, everyone, for your comments. It's so, so helpful. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you all for joining. Uh, the recording will be accessible sometime in June on the Social Justice Center new YouTube channel. <laughs> Very like innovating and like this <laughs> yeah, discovery of new channels like with like new activities we come up with and we'll have our last talk uh, next uh, friday by uh kobe uh will it be here in the library okay, the acts of listening lab it will be an acts of listening yeah. lab okay mm -hmm. so thank you thank you all for joining on zoom and thank you uh a lot Asteli, for your uh, agreeing to comment
Yay. You also had a comment by uh, Ella Amir, who told you, thanks again, I had to leave, but wishing you, Nicola, all the best in your research. Perfect. Thank <laughs> you so much. I know. Wow. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. This was amazing. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Good. No. Yeah. And like, really, I think everyone has like a emotion, like a very emotional. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes, it connects to the, the yeah, experience of so many ways, people. I feel like, yeah. yeah. And it's a heart space, like the way even what you're grappling with is coming from like yeah. an open heart space, which is compelling. I feel so full. Thank oh, you. Look thank at you all so the much. thank yous. Oh, <laughs> yeah, like screenshots. I love that.